Well, thank you for setting me up perfectly for my talk, because you sort of ended with that question of implementation and what really happens when we try to move evidence-based programs and practices into the real world in order to achieve our goal of reducing violence. And that's really the focus of my talk. I'm going to be speaking about um, the science of effective implementation and the fact that it will sort of assume that we have some evidence-based interventions to use. That's, of course, going to vary depending on where you are. But I think that these principles of effective implementation will apply even if you're using, say, more promising approaches, maybe not at the highest level yet of having evidence behind them. But the point is, if you're trying to achieve widespread, widespread reductions in violence, using a particular approach, a program, a policy, or practice, it's going to have certain parameters that define it, and those things need to happen on the ground. So this science of implementation is all about figuring out how to do those things effectively and how to implement them in a supportive context. So I'll be drawing on the work of um, various people who are engaged in implementation science. I wanted to highlight the National Implementation Research Network in the United States. Dean Fixon and Karen Blase have been on the forefront of this. They've also organized a global implementation conference that's gone on the last few years, um, which is of interest to people in various disciplines who are trying to implement public health policies of various kinds. I'll also just give you some sense of my background. I've worked with a lot of schools implementing school-based programs to reduce violence or substance use primarily among youth and also communities who are trying to reduce youth problem behaviors of various sorts, helping them understand what's effective, what's an evidence-based intervention, and then how do you put that into practice in your community and monitor its practice and collect data on the implementation procedures. So um, what is implementation? It is kind of this important middle step between having an evidence-based intervention and getting to your outcome, whether it's reducing violence or something else. It's the processes that must happen. We talk about this black box, and it was just coincidence that I wrote that in black. But the black box, because we don't always pay attention to that middle step, but that's the critical heart of, of where the action is going to happen. And we know that implementation is, is complicated, and it is a process. And it takes a long time to from when you select that evidence-based intervention to actually getting it fully implemented into an agency, a school, or a set of implementation practices across a whole community. So you have to know from the outset that um, just because these evidence-based interventions exist, they're not a magic bullet that you just snap your fingers and your outcome is achieved. Um, so it takes a long time, somewhere between two and four or five years, um, to move from selecting the right evidence-based intervention to that last step of having it up and running in a sustainable way. And of course, some interventions are more complicated and have more working parts than others. Um, in school-based programs, some of them are very straightforward. You might be able to implement them one to two years, but it's still going to take time. Especially, you can't underestimate these first steps of researching what's going to be the best intervention for your particular context. When we talk about implementation, we're really talking about high-quality implementation. Um, making sure you're doing it at the highest, fullest possible level. And that requires things like, again, making sure you're using the right intervention for your context and that the right people are receiving that evidence-based intervention. We see this fall apart all the time, and usually it's due to not enough of investigation of what these interventions require and who is their targeted population. So if an intervention, say multi-systemic therapy, is designed for youth who've already become involved in delinquent behaviors, you wouldn't implement that with youth who are at a lower risk level. Or if an intervention like the Incredible Years is designed for parents who have young children who are already showing conduct problems, 
it's, it's designed for that population. So you want to make sure you're targeting the right population if you want to make that difference. As I've said before, the context has to be supportive. And all that is required for that program has to be done on the local level. You have to implement it fully with all of those core components. And I'll talk about that more in a minute. And of course, the staff who are delivering the intervention have to be trained. They have to be supportive. If they're not enthusiastic about that intervention, it's not ever going to have the, the effects that you want it to have. And we don't always think about this last issue, but I've come to realize that this is very critical, and it's very critical for the point of this meeting. If we want to achieve substantial reductions in violence, it means that these evidence-based interventions have to be implemented uh, with large reach. Oftentimes, at the local level, people get excited about a new program, but they're, they're only thinking on a very small scale, like, I'm going to reach 20 to 30 people with this parenting intervention, which is great for those, those people, those individuals can receive benefits, but if you want to change your whole community of parents and you're only reaching 5% of your population, it's probably not going to be enough to move the dial on violence. So we have to think, you know, start small. You don't want to bite off more than you can chew initially. You should pilot these interventions. But then you always want to be thinking down the road, how can I grow this and implement it more widely? Um, so, you know, that's kind of the big picture of high quality implementation. I also want to drill down to the more particular issues to be aware of when you select a particular intervention. Again, it's going to have certain requirements that need to be considered in advance to make sure that you're prepared to implement those strategies with fidelity. And that means that you are, again, implementing all of the core components that are integral to that program or policy's success that you're implementing all of the activities that should be done, that you are required, you're delivering the content that should be shared with your participants, that the implementers are doing a high quality delivery of the material, and that your participants are engaged, enthusiastic, they're excited to be on the receiving end, and they're actually practicing the new skills that you're trying to deliver to them. We talk about local adaptations sort of as diametrically opposed to this idea of implementation fidelity. And people sort of live at different ends of the spectrum on that. But I think we're moving to a place where everybody's sort of agreeing that it's important to deliver those core components. And we need to know what those core components are. And you have to make sure that those things are implemented. You can make more changes around the surface, the periphery. You can use local examples. You can change um, some things about the delivery style. But you can't mess around with what's made that intervention effective in the first place. Why not? I mean, on the one hand, that sounds very logical that you shouldn't change those core components. On the other hand, at the local level, people are very invested about making sure an intervention works for their population and that their community is different from where that intervention was tested. So again, we have this bit of tension that can exist. But we, what we also know is that if you change those core components and you implement something in such a way that it no longer resembles that tested effective model or that evidence-based model, what's going to happen is that your outcomes, your reductions in violence are going to be jeopardized. And that the higher quality implementation, the better your chance of achieving those desired outcomes. And that evidence-based interventions sometimes only work when they're delivered with quality. And I just wanted to show you a couple of research studies that have looked at this relationship between implementation quality and outcomes. Because it sort of, you know, it shows you some evidence to help back up the statement. This was one of the first studies that looked at this issue. It was a trial of the life skills training drug prevention curriculum, which is done in schools with middle school students. 
This was a trial done back in the 1990s, and what they found was that they compared students who received life skills training with control group students who didn't receive that particular program. And when they looked at all the students who received that intervention compared to all the students in the control group classrooms, there wasn't a huge difference in that particular outcome they were interested in, which was reducing alcohol. But when they looked at the students who were receiving life skills in classrooms where more of the material was delivered, so teachers, actual real life teachers, were the ones implementing this program. And there was variation in how much of it they implemented. And what they saw was when the students in classrooms that received less than 60% of the intervention, um, and then they had students who received more than 60% of the intervention, it was only the students in the higher fidelity classrooms that had significantly different rates of alcohol. So the students who were in those lower fidelity classes really didn't change much. So just implementing part of the intervention isn't going to do you any good. You've invested time and money in it, but you aren't getting the outcomes unless you get to this level. Even more persuasively, there is a study of the Functional Family Therapy Program. This is a high-intensity family therapy program that's designed for families of youth offenders, kids who have already broken the law and come to the attention of officials. They implemented this program across the state of Washington in the U.S., and they found this middle group is what happened to the children who were in the control group, and then they had two different intervention groups. One group received functional family therapy from high implementing therapists, the therapists who are following the model more closely. And then these were the ones who weren't following the model very closely. And these, these kids and their families actually did worse in terms of having a higher probability of being arrested for a felony crime. This is definitely what we don't want to see. Um, and this is kind of scary, but it makes the point very effectively that if you want to reduce violence, you not only have to choose an evidence-based intervention, but you have to implement it with quality. And of course, what happens in the real world is that that implementation quality often suffers. Sometimes we make adaptations because we think we want to make that program better. Um, and I like to use the recipe of having uh, trying to reproduce you know, your grandmother's a famous chicken pot pie recipe. That's what I always use because I love my grandmother's chicken soup recipe, basically. So she wrote down the recipe for her chicken soup, but if I'm implementing it in my own kitchen and I forget, you know, I didn't have the right ingredients or I didn't have six hours to simmer it on my stove, I only have an hour, or I'm allergic to garlic, one of the key ingredients. So I'm making these changes along the way what happens at the end of the day, my soup looks nothing like her soup. It could be better, it could be worse, but there's a danger in, in messing around with that formula. You don't know what your end product is going to be. Why are these evidence-based interventions not well implemented? There's a lot of reasons, and I didn't have about four hours to do this presentation. So I tried to summarize here some of the major reasons why things go wrong. And um, I'll talk in a minute about how to avoid some of these challenges. But again, what happens in the real world is oftentimes right from the beginning you jeopardize the program's success because you haven't chosen the right one for your problem, your participants, or your community. And you have to realize when you're investigating these, these different programs, assuming you have options to choose from, you need to know, well, what does this require? How much time is it going to take? How many implementers do I need? Do the implementers need to have particular qualifications? Of course, you're always going to think about how much money is this going to cost me. But you have to know what other kinds of resources, human resources, it's going to need. Am I going to need partners in the community who can help recruit participants into this intervention? So you have to choose the right one for your situation. 
And of course, you need buy-in from all the key players who will be needed to implement those core components. It's, it's necessary to have one or two key players, we call them champions, people who will get that, that intervention you know, to the local level. But if you don't have wider support, um, that one champion might leave your community and then the program falls apart, or you might need resources from a different uh, agency and you haven't gotten those people on board. So it's important to get that buy-in, and sometimes that doesn't happen. Again, you need to know why and how your evidence-based intervention works so that you're not uh, jeopardizing those core components that made it effective. You have to believe that implementation fidelity is important. Yes, it's important to adapt to your local environment, but you have to understand if you're choosing a particular intervention for a particular reason, it's important to follow that model. Again, you may not have taken the time to prepare for implementation, or you haven't integrated that new in intervention with all the systems that are required that you're going to need resources from. And then finally, um, you haven't actually monitored your implementation practices. This was part of what Arturo was getting at, I think, that you can't just you know, go with it. You have to actually pay attention to what you're doing on the ground, how your intervention is being implemented. We often track things like, well, how many participants did you serve that year? That's good. You want that number. But if you don't track what they actually are receiving, then you don't know if you've been able to make a difference in their lives. And um, I'm not going to be able to talk too much about this, but of course you need the adequate resources to be able to fully implement your intervention. And I'm not an expert in how to get money to do these things, but what I do know, especially in the United States when we're talking about substance use or delinquency or violence prevention, communities are oftentimes doing many, many different programs. One study I, I read said that in a typical school in the United States, they have 14 different delinquency prevention programs going on at any one time. So, and most of the, like less than one of those is probably going to have evidence behind it. So we are spending a lot of resources on things that aren't working. And if we can just divert some of that money into ones that are working, we may be able to find resources. That's easier to say than to do, but um, it's likely there will be some resources out there um, if you think about where you want to spend your money. So in my last uh, five or, or so minutes, how do we get there? How do we avoid some of those challenges? How can we achieve high-quality implementation? Well, it is going to take partnerships across multiple sectors and types of um, partners. Of course, it's good to include the folks who have developed those uh, evidence-based interventions, the people on the ground who are implementing them, but also the people who are higher up in the administration or um, the political, uh, the policy makers who control the resources that you're going to need. More specifically, some of the things that we know from both qualitative and quantitative studies of implementation is it's very important to have that local buy-in and the local planning and ownership of that new intervention. I can come into a community and tell them what kinds of things work, uh, but I can't really make it happen on the ground. They have to. And the local folks are the ones who know about their context and the type of uh, people who live in their community, the types of resources that they have. So they need to be the ones doing the work on the ground. But of course, they should be doing that in consultation with, hopefully, with, with more academic folks who have access to some of the information about what works. Um, they have to create a very detailed plan about how this evidence-based intervention is going to be implemented in their context. You can read all you want about an, an intervention, but until you put the details down on a piece of paper, you don't always think about what's required. Um, for example, 
I've worked with communities who want to do parent training programs, say a program that's like seven weekly sessions for two hours at a time that have to involve parents and youth. Well, when you start looking at a calendar of the year and you try to plot out, okay, what's the best seven-week interval of time in my community? And how many people do I have to implement this with to make a substantial difference in my community? If I'm 40,000 people, it really makes it very real when you try to uh, have an outline for your implementation. Again, you have to make sure it's integrated into your agency so it's not seen as peripheral to the core of that agency. If it's kind of on the periphery, it's going to be the first thing to be cut when there's money problems. And that's why you also need the strong administrative support. In terms of um, having supportive implementers, one of the best things to do is to engage those people in the conversation right from the beginning about what kind of intervention do we want to do in our school, in our youth serving organization, et cetera. If they don't have a voice in making that decision, they're not going to be very supportive. If they're just told, show up to this training on you know, September 18th and you're doing something new, that's not a very happy situation. Um, and the local community should be linked up to somebody who is more experienced in that model, who can provide the training and ongoing assistance, especially in that first year of implementation where these challenges are faced, and to help you get past of those, those challenges. And if you're not documenting and evaluating and observing the implementation process on the ground, you're not going to be aware of the challenges that are faced and the solutions that you need to put in place to overcome them. So I could spend a lot more time on each of these things. Hopefully, we'll have some, some time here at the end if you want to ask questions. But I tried to summarize here on the last slide. OK, so what would be the main things that I think we need to do in terms of supporting high quality implementation? is first of all, this is a bigger picture issue, but convince the public of the need to do these violence prevention interventions. And other people have mentioned that this morning. We spend a lot of resources on the back end with law enforcement and justice um, agency officials locking people up. When if we just spent a fraction of the money on prevention interventions, uh, we would be better off in the long run. If we can convince people on the local ground that they need to spend some time in advance preparing for implementation, researching what is the best strategy for their intervention, and help, helping them access those different models that are available to them, that is what needs to happen. And then building that local infrastructure to collect data that's meaningful, not just number of participants, but what are you doing on the ground when you're implementing and implementing programs and then using that to make changes when necessary. And then finally, this idea of implementing interventions at scale more broadly in your local population in order to reach the majority of participants um, who need to be served by that particular intervention. Okay, I have uh, just listed some of the sources that I used for this presentation here. Uh, thanks for your time and...